All right, so welcome everyone. Uh, my name is Dmitry Zhukharevich. Uh, I'm a research fellow at the uh, Center for Science and Technology Studies, European University in St. Petersburg. We are continuing uh, our new series of uh, Zoom seminars um, on the social studies of climate change. And today uh, we are very happy and excited to have with us uh, Megan Black who is a professor of history uh, of U.S. environmental uh, management and foreign relations um, in the late 19th and 20th centuries. Uh, Megan is a professor of history at, at MIT. She's the author of The Global Interior, Mineral, Mineral Frontiers and American Power, an award-winning book uh, that was published by Harvard University Press in 2018. Uh, the book analyzes the surprising role of the U.S. Department of, of the Interior in pursuing minerals around the world. And I think it's very relevant for us here because uh, we just had a series of, um, an, another series of seminars with climate scientists who in various ways emphasized how, or uh, the, the, the borderless character of, um, you know, climatic and environmental phenomena. Mm -hmm. And um, so I'm hoping Megan will talk about that as well. Um, uh, Megan Black previously taught in the Department of International History at the London School of Economics and uh, did postdoctoral work at Charles Warren Center for Studies in American History at Harvard and the John Sloan Dickey Center for International Understanding at Dartmouth College. Uh, let me also say that Megan's work uh, exemplifies the best kind of um, interdisciplinary work because it spans several scholarly disciplines including uh, environmental history, American studies, history of science. Um, so yeah, with that, uh, um, I'm gonna shut up and leave the floor to Megan. Oh, thank you, Dimitri, for that lovely introduction and to you all for tuning in from wherever you might be located in the world. I'll kind of situate myself for you. I'm, I'm tuning in from Arlington, Massachusetts. Um, which is just north of Cambridge, for those of you who might have been in the area or I hope may be able to come someday. Um, and I'm delighted to get to present work with a group um, in science and technology studies. It's a world that I've always felt myself to be a satellite to and kind of orbiting around and learning from, even as my, my home discipline of history um, still has much to learn from the methods and the interdisciplinary methods of these kinds of um, these collaborative and and, um, and path-breaking um, research agendas. So I, I'm going to begin by sharing some slides. Dimitri and I tested this and we're hopeful that it will, will go smoothly. Um, and then I'll open, as historians often do, more with a story before kind of stepping back to talk a little bit about the stakes. So um, if you will indulge me, let's turn back time here for a discussion of an event in February of 1967. So as we see here, um, in February of 1967, the Secretary of the Interior, Stuart Udall, and his signature bolo tie, is the kind of aesthetic choice here, were embarking on a two-week journey across the Middle East. Their tour included a stopover in Saudi Arabia, um, as is depicted in the image, where um, this uh, Secretary of the Interior was meeting um, people on the ground to discuss a variety of land use projects. Now, I'll point out that Saudi Arabia is a place far afield from the American West, where Udall, a politician from Arizona, had famously overseen a variety of land management projects, and that included hydroelectric dams and the creation of wildlife refuges. On this particular journey, his stated purpose in the Middle East was to um, talk about water desalination and national park creation. But he also undertook activities that the international community had come to see as deeply political, those dealing with US mineral interests. And his main purpose in Saudi Arabia was to investigate and smooth over the highly charged oil situation under King Faisal, who he described as an old camel raider. And um, this was of course a dismissive reference to the modernizing leader of the land in ways that kind of invoked um, U.S. indigenous relations as well. Um, so 
Arab news media, however, suspected that Udall's intentions were farther ranging than um, desalination and national park creation, and they charged him with manipulating the oil economy. But to refute these accusations, Udall insisted with all due modesty that it, he was just, quote, an innocent minister of the interior who should be called minister of natural resources. And by using this as a defense, he thought the implication was clear. What could he, or the Interior Department for that matter, have to do with the politics of the world? So I use this question and this prompt to open up my book, The Global Interior, which Dimitri nicely framed. And I quickly answer that question with the claim that the US Interior Department had far more to do with the politics of the world than had been previously accounted for. Today, and I understand that some explanation is actually needed because these um, meanings are quite different across national borders. So the US Interior Department is known for managing natural resources and the nation's parks, as well as superintending Native American affairs. And it's remit and environmental management by which all kind of signal a way of organizing federal governments to oversee non-human uh, nature and environmental well-being. Well, this remit is widely understood to be fixed to the home and, and located within the United States and as a kind of domestically focused entity. However, in the 20th century, the Interior Department oversaw a quest for minerals across a seemingly disparate array of zones in American Indian lands, but also formal US territories, foreign nations, the oceans, and even outer space. So contrary to conventional wisdom, the Interior Department operated in a global field, in some ways a more than global field. And while this field had been staked out over the course of a century, we can actually use just the story of Stuart Udall um, as a way to kind of move through this widening circuit of Interior's influence. In other words, he can serve as a sort of guide on a whistle-stop tour of the department's widening domain because during his tenure as secretary, he would not only venture to the Middle East, but would also supervise Indian affairs as seen here in a photo op with a Navajo elder on a Navajo reservation at the opening of a coal-fired power plant. He would oversee territories of the United States, um, including Guam and Samoa, where he's depicted in this image, because actually U.S. territories had fallen under the Interior Department's jurisdiction since the New Deal. And he would undertake diplomatic missions to Africa, Asia, and Latin America, um, pictured here in Santiago, Chile, where Interior had supervised natural resource programs since the earliest days of international development. Um, oh, you'll see, once again, the bolo tie made the trip as part of his cowboy diplomacy. It's one way to read it. And he would manage the exploration and leasing of the continental shelf um, of the United States, which actually added to the department's jurisdiction a mineral rich expanse of land nearly the size of the Louisiana Purchase. And you know, granted it was underwater, um, but this, this also was something the department had been a part of historically expropriating. Um, here we see Udall above water, of course, um, on a boat off the coast of Puerto Rico. And the kind of final note that I'll, I'll hit here is that he would advance a space exploration agenda that involved a rather colorful attempt to mine the moon and a more consequential attempt to create a satellite that could view Earth's resources, in particular resources that had yet to be tapped um, in a kind of global context. And this is the history behind the Landsat satellite, which I'll reference a little bit later as well. And here we see Udall in uh, Johnson Space Center in Houston, Texas. And I'll just note that it is pretty ironic to be in Houston and to abstain from wearing the bolo tie and to kind of opt for the standard black tie. But I do this kind of, there should be a dissertation somewhere on the sartorial choices of Stuart Udall. So if you know an eager graduate student, please point them in this direction. Um, and I'm being, I'm being a little uh, cheeky here, but what I do hope is kind of coming through in, in this tour with Stuart Udall is that there are many ways to kind of interpret his role in these different kinds of activities. And, you know, some might see it as just a benign export of American values and technical modernity overseas. 
But I, in the course of writing my book, came to see this as an important institutional linkage between US settler colonialism and other forms of projecting American power. Um, and that included supporting capital in, capitalist interests and offshoring ecological tolls in foreign contexts. That's kind of one of the main ways that I um, view this process. So I want to proceed today as follows. I'll, I'll chart out the kind of two key coordinates of the research agenda in this book, and I'll try to flag how I see it contributing to the fields of environmental history and, and the history of the United States and the world. Um, and I do think that, you know, we'll be able to draw out connections around um, the history of science and also this very important question about a warming world, about climate change. Um, so, so we can maybe build on that also in the Q&A. But the first thing is just the key argument of the global interior. And effectively, I claim that this department institutionalized a skill set that had been cultivated in 19th century westward expansion um, that ultimately underpinned its environmental management. And that critically, environmental management actually became a key mechanism for expanding um, U.S. influence overseas, a, a way of extending U.S. personnel in other zones and beyond borders in the 20th century. And in the second section, I'm going to turn more to ideas, actually, and think about the ways that ideas about non-human nature actually help to justify this kind of border crossing work, this interventionism, um, and that it was especially um, important or surprising given the global commitments to preserving borders and respecting borders and self-determination. So much of the history that I'll be talking about with you today is after the founding of the United Nations. It's a moment when, you know, technically anti-imperialism is enshrined at the level of international order and politics, but for which we know there are still many ways that um, a variety of actors are crossing borders and, and exerting influence in material landscapes, which is kind of where my emphasis is. Um, so uh, to kind of work through this, um, this history, I'm going to um, emphasize one particular case study from the book. So rather than trying to do it all, I'm going to, I'm going to kind of dive into one chapter that focuses in particular on the Interior Department's role pursuing minerals in U.S. international development efforts, um, beginning with the, the kind of 1949 launch of President Harry S. Truman's Point Four program, and um, and I'll I'll look at how you know this these kinds of development efforts we became oriented more and more to the process of prospecting minerals, and that that actually connects in odd ways with the space race and the department's own involvements, and in then trying to create a satellite that could help with locating reserves, mineral reserves across borders. So, um, so that's the, the kind of trajectory. And ultimately, I'll, I'll show that there is a history of expansionism at the heart of environmental management in the United States. And even as environmentalism is urgently necessary, um, there, there is a kind of dynamic that I think we need to learn from and that history helps us to think about, which is that in the US context, there was a flip side to conservation and environmental management at home. And that actually it coincided with the expansion of and a willingness to exploit resources beyond US borders. And that actually there's an institutional connection because the same agency is doing both, right? The US Interior Department is helping conserve resources at home and actively seeking minerals beyond borders. So, um, this is something too that the history reveals to be dependent on things like racialized labor and the exploitation of landscapes that have been, you know, continuing objects of critique in an anti-imperialist framework. So, um, so I do think that this will give us some, some things to think about as we um, consider a period of anthropogenic climate change and the calls for environmental justice um, today. So let's turn to, um, the, the kind of first part of this discussion and contemplate how the Interior Department came to play this outsized role in the world in the first place. Because in many ways, um, 
this problem of how the interior department came to have a global portfolio is the paradox that, um, or, or the riddle that really drove me in my graduate career. And I'm gonna kind of reflect on that here. So the, um, the idea that interior employees were trading in assignments in places like um, the American West for ones in places like Afghanistan is something that struck me as a contradiction. I saw this in the archives. I was in graduate school in Washington, DC. I, I would uh, venture to the, to the National Archives and noted um, that in uh, unlikely places, from my view, interior mineral experts were crossing borders and widely so in Afghanistan, Bolivia, Colombia, um, and, and about 30 additional countries that were participating, as it turns out, in international development. So this struck me as being quite odd until I encountered a speech from one interior secretary who was trying to make sense of it all. And I'm gonna kind of turn to that for all of us. Um, so this assistant secretary's name was Vernon Northrup and on United Nations Day in 1952, he was reflecting on international politics. And he explained the department's activity across the so-called underdeveloped world by pointing to its history managing the American frontier. So I'm gonna quote him and it's, it's in front of you here. Once it was the undeveloped West of the 1850s, which constituted a primary reason for the establishment of this department and conditioned its development. Now it is the underdeveloped areas of the free world of the 1950s. And he concludes that the interior department has the know-how and the skills needed to bring about opening this new frontier. So, well, this, this source kind of gave me pause, but it, it it also helped me to see that it was not at all strange, according to this logic, that the Interior Department was at the forefront of the US expansionist agenda. Rather, the fact that it appeared to me as strange was itself the problem that needed to be interrogated. Um, so at, at this moment then, sources like Northrop pushed me further back in time to try to piece together these, um, you know, these claimed origins of the department. And what I learned is that actually the U.S. Department of the Interior had been founded in the U.S. War with Mexico, or at the very end of the U.S. War with Mexico in 1848. And so it happened on, on March 3rd, 1949. And what I'll kind of pitch to you is that the Department of the Interior had in important ways always been exterior and pushing exterior. So on March 3rd, 1849, uh, US Congress created this department to oversee continental expansion at a time when the fledgling federal government was struggling to manage and keep pace with rapid transformations wrought of westward settlement. Um, and a, one example among many included the proliferation of land claims associated with the gold rush of 1849. So in California, many um, mining outfitters were quickly um, moving to the coast and participating in what scholars have shown to be a genocide against California Indians um, around the discovery of Sutter's Mill. Interior employees trailed behind the US Army. So of course there are other kinds of government actors on the ground as well. Um, but behind the, the kind of violent and military force, the Interior Department worked to incorporate expropriated land into the national fold and actively helped to prepare it for capitalist utilization and settlement. Um, they were also joined by private entities like the railroad corporations. Um, and they were also accused and often guilty of great incompetence and even just overt corruption. But these agents, um, first for local fees and later as salaried parts of the, the administration, nevertheless undertook the day-to-day -day work of settler colonialism. And here I'm actually gonna pause to think about the kind of comparative view because it is the case that when Congress founded the US Interior Department, they framed it as being in parallel with or similar to the kind of ministries of interior or home in Europe. But you might note that these actually look quite different today when we look at them. And very often ministries of interior are actually overseeing matters of law and security. 
Um, but part of what I argue is that the kind of moment of this federal bureaucracy's creation coincided with like the problem of the time, which the problem of the time was expansionism in the United States. So it, um, it really shaped governance in a moment when to kind of turn to Weber and think about bureaucracy. This is like a moment where um, there is a greater level of bureaucratization in government. And it happened to be that you know, the, this massive vast expropriation of land as part of US settler colonialism um, was the, the kind of stimuli creating the drive for this department in the first time. So I'm actually kind of pointing to this section of the quote in front of you too, where it says, you know, the undeveloped West is the primary reason for the establishment of this department. From there, what did they do? They worked to subordinate the terrain and the indigenous nations with competing sovereign claims to that land. And in that sense, interior personnel oversaw the surveying, parceling, codifying, disposing, settling, and utilizing of land. Um, Dimitri and I were talking earlier about uh, Foucauldian methods. And in many ways, I think of this, this work of enumeration and um, the kind of day-to-day -day work of settler colonialism as being a very critical part of the, the attempt to, um, to know to make legible and then ultimately to manage um, this enlarged territory. And then to kind of turn to US history, what we see is that interior personnel actually facilitated important processes that seem to bring about what, what commentators at the time and scholars sense have called the closing of the frontier in US history. Uh, this is something that was first remarked by the historian Frederick Jackson Turner in 1893 in a rather well-regarded or well-known speech in US history. And I'll say that the frontier is a highly charged category in my main subfields of interest. It's a, a concept that has been nearly ubiquitous in US history as, as folks since this Frederick Jackson Turner um, moment commented on the seeming importance of the frontier in national development. And Turner's argument went something like this. The frontier by which he meant a kind of a seeming boundary line between wilderness and civilization created a kind of crucible for American democracy. And it was in those spaces that, you know, something singular and exceptional could emerge. Um, and of course, this is a very celebratory view of US history, one that also erases indigenous people from its view. And you might imagine that since that time, many scholars have um, revised and, and critiqued Turner's claim about this, this frontier concept. So I'm, I'll just kind of go through a handful of these that are important to, to kind of framing my contribution. Um, some, in the field of US foreign relations in like the 1950s were, um, were taking a very critical approach to Turner's thesis about the frontier and applying it to something like US formal imperialism in the 1898 moment with the Philippines and Puerto Rico. So this is known as the Wisconsin School and they saw the frontier not in this positive light but as a kind of dynamo driving um, a, a bid for more materials and markets and labor that would perpetuate imperialism in the United States and other forms. Um, other scholars in American studies are, were asking questions about the kind of cultural and ideological underpinnings of the frontier mythology conveyed in numerous works of American culture. And they, they saw the kind of racial and gendered and nationalist ideologies under pinning the, uh, the frontier as something that also helped to rationalize and compel US expansionism overseas. Um, but these are hardly the only, the only scholars to weigh in or the, the subfields to be interested in the frontier. US environmental historians were also very invested in questions about this concept in part because they, they saw it as an invitation to bring the material landscape that so often fell from view in conversations about history into the, the forefront of people's analysis. And, um, and they had an array of interpretations. Donald Worstard showed how the drive to conquer nature through projects, for instance, um, that involved dam building or the creation of irrigation networks in the arid west were actually really 
critical to nation building. Um, so this was a process uh, associated with the mid 19th century and late 19th century, in which the government helped to um, or tried to create a patchwork of small farms in the arid West and compel settlement of white um, migrants into those zones by, um, by bringing water and harnessing water resources in, um, in the creation of infrastructure. We actually are looking at this history in this, um, in this mural in front of us which actually is, um, is hanging in the US Interior Department to this day. So you might imagine that officials walk past this and understand this as part of their uh, institutional history. This is a history that's romanticized and, and sanitized in the sense that it overlooks the noted failures of the attempt to turn the arid west into this kind of oasis. So um, there are many scholars who talk about the problem of fire or like wildfires in the American West strung, that have sprung up in response to these kinds of failed projects of um, irrigation. And there were many inequalities as water was redirected from other from some communities, often communities of color, and toward um, you know cities that were um, kind of designated for uh, white settlement. So that's a major kind of literature that also thinks about the frontier. And finally, people have exploded the idea of the the tidy line on the map in the in the first place. And um, here, there's a, a group of both environmental and borderlands scholars who have called attention to um, the real hybridity that characterizes zones rather than a kind of line between wilderness and civilization. And, you know, I'm sure, I'm guessing that a lot of these um, kinds of inquiries dovetail with, with other literatures that, that you are, um, are interested in. But what, what I'm trying to do is kind of set up the scaffolding to explain where I see my work contributing. Um, and to say that at this kind of nexus of the study of US empire and US environmental management, um, I am trying to think about the, um, the drive outward and to, um, to kind of nuance our understanding of it by looking at how these federal processes associated with the frontier, um, which is a euphemism for the expropriation of land, actually conditioned a skill set and knowledge of expansion that has often underpinned what appears as a neutral form of environmental management. And that this kind of um, what becomes Interior's renowned conservation platform, and then its kind of environmentalist platform of the 20th century, bears some of the markings of this original expansionist project. And that might help to understand in turn how in the 20th century, the Interior Department could so consistently be brought in to do the work of expanding into new zones, right? So again, kind of thinking about this, um, the connections between expansion and environmental management as something that helps to guide US global reach and new forms um, is, is uh, a way of kind of adding to that already um, very um, lush kind of tapestry of explaining US history in this moment. Now within the kind of multifaceted world of non-human nature, my work focuses on minerals in particular. And I, I want to kind of explain that because what I came to see in looking at this institution's history is that minerals provided an important arena in which experts could claim authority. And they were, of course, becoming a, an increasingly important part of industrial society in the late 19th century and 20th century. Um, but there's also a story here about competition within the government and among agencies over the kinds of resources that they claim expertise over. So in the 1860s, sprung from the Interior Department was the US Department of Agriculture. And the US Department of Agriculture ends up exerting a greater influence over what I might call biological resources. It's, it's not a perfect designation, but something that helps to kind of differentiate the non-renewable resources that the Department of the Interior ends up superintending in particular. Um, and there's more to say about that because certainly the Interior Department manages fish and wildlife today and manages other things, but but there's a great deal, like a, a central kind of 
um, consolidation of power around minerals and oil that is important to this department's history. And I see minerals providing new frontiers, right? Those that are defined less by territorial boundaries than by physical limits um, that then, you know, the department uh, can leave intact boundaries while working overseas, but still do the work of bringing in materials valuable to the nation. So I'm specifically talking about the Geological Survey and Bureau of Mines um, who have continually been uh, sent to these fronts. And hence in 1899, after the supposed close of the American frontier, which coincided with America's imperial projection in the Philippines, Cuba, and Puerto Rico, among others, interior officials ventured to those territories to survey for minerals, to share those reports with invest, like investors at home, and to broadly promote American capitalism overseas. And the department continued these tasks with incredible consistency over the, the following century. So let's talk um, a bit about the, the way that this skill set was being oriented to a, a later moment in, in the 1950s, right? So back to Northrop, in other words, in this United Nations state context. Um, by linking the undeveloped West of the 1850s to the undeveloped world of the 1950s, Northrop was specifically referring to a set of activities that were beginning to unfold as part of President Harry S. Truman's Point Four program. This was a foreign policy initiative that is called the Four Point Program because, or, or the Point Four Program, because it was the fourth point listed in his inaugural address in 1949, stating his values and what the United States would pursue overseas. So what he had claimed in that inaugural address and what became codified in policy was the, the effort to extend American scientific and technical expertise to the so-called backward areas of the world. The Point Four program was a launch pad for what uh, we call now US modernization or development which overtly sought to bring about social improvement and was explicitly against outside exploitation. So a very famous line associated with this launch of this program is, um, is the following. Truman says, the old imperialism, exploitation for profit, has no place in our plans. So there was just one problem though, as some US officials did still want to retain certain benefits of imperialism, and that included securing differential access to raw materials, so materials drawn from foreign landscapes through um, the labor of others. And as part of ongoing Cold War competition with the Soviet Union, the United States used well-documented tactics to secure strategic resources that were desired both for national security and post-war abundance. One notorious case involved the US CIA helping to orchestrate the coup in Iran, um, overthrowing the popularly elected leader, Mohammad Mossadegh um, in 1953, because he was denying the United States and Great Britain access to oil. And this is well-documented in the literature and, they, and justly so. Um, so. However, part of what my research helps to reveal is that the United States also relied on more inconspicuous efforts that weren't necessarily involving coups, um, assassination attempts, as, in, um, as is also the, the story of US power in the Cold War, but that similar kinds of extractive ends were being met through international development programs. So the Interior Department technicians that I write about went to places like Iran, Afghanistan, Colombia, the Philippines, and Egypt, and they drew upon experiences in the American West, past and ongoing, to unearth minerals in the present in these new zones. And their efforts revolved around an evolving set of procedures. So in one example, in the mission to Peru, um, there is a geologist named George Erickson, who is a geologist from Butte, Montana. And if any of you have heard of Anaconda Copper, this is like the site of the main Berkeley pit. Um, so he grew up in that context. He trained with the US Geological Survey. And much as his colleagues did in the West, he would um, 
on oversee surveys in the um, kind of different landscapes across Peru, looking for um, lead, iron, tungsten, copper, and zinc deposits. But to do so, he would load burrows with the different kinds of instruments. He would enlist what they called native camp hands. And these were methods that had been tried and true in the US Geological Survey for decades. He then compiled those reports and disseminated them not only to host countries, which certainly host countries did get a copy of the report that said, here's what's in your nation, but they also made them available to American investors. And, um, and let me talk a little bit more. So I've, I've given you one vignette that gives a sense of what happened on the ground, but I also tried to get a visual on what the methodology was, what the skill set, what the procedures were that were implemented across borders. And the, there are five main ones that you'll see kind of at the top of this table that I look at in um, by looking at the uh, country mission files of international development for each of these places, as well as interior department files. So we see that strategic mineral surveys were a key part of the process but also things like laboratory testing of minerals. So if, um, if a kind of deposit was located, they would undertake efforts to kind of um, harness a sample of that. It could be like a ton of rock that would be shipped back to the United States to its labs in Denver, in College Park and, and so on for testing. So the United States knew with great specificity what was um, presenting in foreign countries. Another process um, very important to, uh, to our story is just initiating mining operations and drilling that drew from mechanization. Um, often this meant that the United States was selling like specialized equipment for mining, like the Denver hoist machine to foreign governments. Um, and you know, broadly helping to order and organize labor in ways that would um, accelerate the pace with which uh, different uh, communities were extracting minerals. There was a mine code revision to change the law to make it lawful for foreign uh, companies, for instance, to explore and operate in nations. So one example, Egypt had um, in 1948 created a law that prohibited foreign companies from investing in certain kinds of mining and exploration. With the help of the Interior Department's point four experts, they changed that law to incentivize the exploration and uh, investment of foreign outfitters. And finally, they would consult with companies and company reps on the ground. And this included um, things like or companies like Reynolds Metals Company, National Lead Company, Standard Oil Company. So, um, so those happened with a, a great deal of consistency. Now, one point is that very clearly, things did not happen the same across national borders. And this makes, of course, a ton of sense given the distinctive politics, economics, culture, and geological realities um, of the many nations that interior personnel we're working in. But part of what I see is a slow and incremental and even painstaking effort to know what um, mineral content existed across borders. And this is something that I refer to as like the spade work of extractive capitalism. And to this day, if you were to look at even metadata in like ArcGIS to see um, like certain kinds of information about mapping or, or like the content of natural resources in certain places, much of this is drawn from these kinds of reports from the US Geological Survey and the Bureau of Mines. Now, at the same time, I'll just reflect on what's happening within US borders because it is certainly the case that the Interior Department was also still running the Bureau of Indian Affairs and applying similar methods to Native American reservations at home. So I'm just gonna kind of skip ahead to a discussion of, um, of the way that, that those two processes were actually mutually reinforcing. Um, so uh, what the way I'll kind of think about this here is that the leader of the point four mission in Iran is depicted on the front cover of his memoir. His name is William Warren. You see him leading the people. He had actually been a bureaucrat whose career was tied to the, to the Bureau of Reclamation first, but then later Indian education. 
specifically education in Navajo reservation um, in the English language and um, in um, industry that were a part of a very regrettable history of, um, of Indian education and indoctrination. I don't know if you've been following the headlines, but there are very many noted um, violences and traumas associated with the process of forcing this, this kind of education. Canada, in British Columbia, they just unearthed a mass grave from one of the, the Indian education sites. So, um, so by the 1950s, these, these traumas were taking new form and there was, you know, there, there, I'm not trying to link Warren specifically with, um, for example, the tuberculosis crises that would often um, in the early 20th century seriously um, injure and, and in some cases lead to the death of children in those contexts. But this was his background, right? And it seemed that that modernizing Navajo Nation had given him what he needed to carry forward to Iran, right? So this kind of skill set in, um, in the public health and education reforms there was then what justified him shifting his desk job from Washington DC to Tehran. And I'm gonna quote him. He, he explained why interior officials were exterior by saying that they were quote, to apply techniques proved valuable in the Indian service to encourage isolated peoples to adopt modern methods in their work and to utilize their resources to their own best possible advantage. And the resource of greatest interest in this context was oil. Um, so Warren was also commenting on Mossadegh, who was in power when he started this um, point, point four program there. He derided Mossadegh's fanatical nationalism and said that the, the leader was um, failing to understand oil's value. And therefore, uh, he was causing great harm in the nation. So Warren was quite relieved after Mossadegh was overthrown in this more well-documented chapter in US foreign relations history, because he said now he could do his job. He could implement new geological surveys and organize the new petroleum industry, effectively opening resource investments in Iran. Now for such mineral agendas to unfold under point four, which was meant to be the opposite of the old imperialism posed its own kind of ethical problems because in the context of post-war decolonization, outside exploitation of minerals had become a ready symbol of imperialism. And many interior officials were aware of this. They tried not to, to trigger associations with arch imperialists like King Leopold in Belgian Congo or Cecil Rhodes in Southern Africa. And so they had this kind of tenuous balancing act because on the one hand, they understood that these mining investments were not benefiting local communities, even though that was meant to be the case in international development agendas. And in fact, one um, foreign mineral official, W.D. Johnston, privately admitted this. It was a problem that mining was so capital intensive, very often it meant outside investors were the ones who were um, drawing the greatest profits from mining and that it was siphoning away profits as a result. Yet the government official acknowledged that they still were worthwhile because they were supporting America's strategic mineral interests. And one thing that you know you might notice, this might seem like um, like people were just very consciously trying to conceal their real motives. And I think for a few actors that it was the case, you know, there is an awareness that they are, um, that they are claiming to help people across borders, but that the real benefits are staying with the United States. But I'm also interested in the way that they just kind of understood their role as being one that, um, that helped to ennoble these activities. So one way I'll get at this is to ask the question, how did a dynamic that did look a little bit like the old imperialism manage to appear for many officials as a complete departure from the old imperialism? And this takes us to the this kind of shorter last section on ideas. Because um, when the interior department's personnel were promoting things like mineral programs and international development, they were putting forward a vision of a borderless nature that was in need of environmental protection and that natural resource experts needed to cross borders 
in order to assure the global and environmental good. So back to Northrop, the way he explained this is to say, natural resources, land, water, and minerals know no national boundaries. Like Earth, of which they are a part, they are global. Now, this observation implied that resources belong to all. Um, and this is something that I call in the book resource globalism. And it helped, though, to solve a kind of problem of borders after the founding of the United Nations. Um, borders had become highly politicized in 1945 with this multilateral institution and a broader international commitment to respecting self-determination. And of course, I've already mentioned this, but United Nations Day is the context for Northrop's speech. So he's very clearly thinking about these issues. What I suggest is that ideas about nature helped officials downplay borders, albeit selectively and in, when in US interests. And I think we see this desire readily apparent in a graphic for also from 1952, a report that interior officials were, were helping to um, contribute to. Uh, this is a report called Resources for Freedom. It was chronicling post-war resource scarcity. And I'll say that when I first saw this globe, which ultimately became the cover of my book, I was struck that there are actually no recognizable continents on this planet, let alone national borders. Um, it imagines a kind of global grid that upholds a landmass that is rife with certain forms of non-human nature. We see hydroelectric dams, atomic energy facilities, oil derricks, um, mining operations, and the like. So natural resources dominate, national borders fall from view. And in this sense, you know, one can see how the claim that resources belong to all, the kind of global resourcesism, um, the resource globalism vision is one that could also betray their kind of unilateral claims. Because another reading of this globe is that it effectively deterritorializes the American interior and projects it onto a global screen. Um, so this leads me to a second argument and a contribution in environmental history where I'm trying to think about the ways that the seemingly obvious claim that nature was borderless helped to provide grounds for intervention, seemingly more neutral grounds for intervention. And it was particularly useful because intermingling with the idea that nature was borderless was this insistence that nature was apolitical, somehow opposite of, um, of kind of political machination. And it was this commitment to a binary between politics and nature that later allowed Stuart Udall to make a plea of political innocence in the Middle East on grounds that he was merely a minister of natural resources, right? Like what could I have to do with the politics of the world? Um, and I'll note, I've talked a lot about the United States, but I think it's worth um, kind of turning to a story that helps us to understand that, you know, there are other kinds of international actors at this moment who were also thinking of environment as a kind of counterpoint, even a strategic counterpoint to um, political moves. And I'll, I'll explain this by turning to a, a very brief but interesting Cold War encounter between Stuart Udall and um, Soviet Premier Nikita Khrushchev in 1962. Um, because uh, this actually was a, uh, it, while it might seem unusual that Udall was there as a kind of ambassador to the United States, he was on a planned tour checking out the renowned Soviet hydroelectric dams. Um, and they got to have a kind of personal conversation that faithfully would um, convey some of the key intelligence that would spark the Cuban Missile Crisis. But initially, the conversation seemed to be pretty low key, right? Um, Udall was talking about his own humble upbringing in Arizona and trying to compare himself to the humble Soviet peasant. Um, he was you know, celebrating how the United States and Soviet Union had these similarities in terms of their natural resource abundance. Um, and he even championed their like shared pioneering spirit as a way to kind of butter up Khrushchev. And um, I'll say that these attempts at flattery were not so successful um, that Khrushchev kind of waved, a, waved away the, the boasts and, um, and was noting that the United States' power was on decline um, and 
you know, didn't take so seriously Udall's attempts to try to see these, these two nations in common cause, especially given the ongoing um, uh, deep anti-communist threads of the Democratic Party that, um, that Udall was representing. So in this conversation, Khrushchev said to Udall, it's been a long time since you could spank us like a little boy, and now we can swat your ass, um, end quote. And this is often understood to be like the, the indicator of the intent to support uh, Castro. Khrushchev even confided that he was responding to Castro's request for aid in defense, in a defense against colonialism. And so it was a kind of hazy form of intelligence that was being communicated. But the, the note that is interesting to me at the end is that Khrushchev told Udall to keep this off the record not to tell the press what happened. And in the end, he said, tell the press that we talked about electric power plants, which again is the kind of move to say that environmental management um, as a topic is one that one does not suspect to coincide with, um, with something like geopolitics or, or the workings of um, a kind of more important form of political power. And I'll say that whatever arguments people offered, whether it's Udall or Khrushchev or otherwise, that doesn't mean that audiences bought the argument in the nations where the minerals were coming out of the ground. And I do want to acknowledge that, you know, there was resistance. Um, local mine workers in point four would go on strikes. Uh, third world leaders became more militant in protecting resources using the United Nations or even founding consortiums like the Organization of Petroleum Exporting Countries. And um, as, these, as the Interior Department faced these different challenges, it would continue to seek a variety of even imaginative solutions. So they looked to the depths of the ocean in the form of the continental shelf, but also the deep ocean floor. They began investigating ways to mine there. And they turned to outer space in ways that um, kind of helped to bring us uh, to that kind of tidbit I referenced earlier around the creation of the Landsat satellite. Because as it happens, Udall's part helping to create the satellite is really tied to the history of international development that I've been laying out here, the Point Four program and after. Because the reason that the uh, satellite was desired in the first place in the 1960s is that geologists who were working in the field in places like Brazil were struggling to access the places where they could explore for minerals. This was a problem of infrastructure, but also a problem of political will. And, um, and what they ultimately decided is that if they could just get off the ground and look down, they could have um, a, a tool at their disposal to know where resources were in waiting. Excuse me. So Udall took this idea seriously that a satellite would really help these mineral programs at international development and help to um, promote the agenda with NASA. At the end, he summarized the gold this way. If we don't find the pot of gold at the end of the rainbow, then we may someday spot it from the rainbow. The satellite, he summarized, would literally prospect from the sky. And about uh, three years later, the, the kind of vision that he had was implemented with the launch of the first Earth resource satellite, um, what eventually became Landsat 1. But today I want to end our talk by reflecting also on how interiors, I know how and ideas about nature collided with people on the ground in a, a slightly more substantive way. So often I'm thinking about the satellites I view or the view of planners. I'll just um, kind of end by describing one creative coalition that directly confronted the, um, the Interior Department's mineral agenda and its claim to superior technical know-how when it came to um, environment. And that is a coalition that called itself the Council of Energy Resource Tribes, um, a group of energy-rich tribes in the American West in the 1970s whose lands were being targeted after the energy crisis, right? So as other supplies and access to oil became more difficult for the United States, um, officials, including those in the Interior Department, were looking at uh, what had been viewed as wastelands in the United States, many of which um, the 
the kind of uranium and low sulfur strippable coal and oil shale rich land fell under Native American reservations. So seeing this um, kind of new era of encroachment, they forged a pan-tribal coalition and they even called themselves the Indian OPEC and would hire Iran's former minister of finance and oil to be their chief economist, but that's another story we could potentially dive into. And what is interesting to me is that they understood that a kind of transnational solidarity was appropriate given the kind of global range of US mineral gambits. Um, so it's the case that they viewed their, their problem as being an extension of a larger history of resource exploitation that OPEC could understand, that OPEC nations could uh, share in sympathy with. And in that way, they refused to accept the terms that the Interior Department set out about its own environmental management, its infallibility, but also its neutrality, that it was somehow apolitical because um, certainly it affected political life for Native Americans um, in and through this, um, this period of intense energy resource development. And I'll say that the, the coalition was not without its critics um, because it embraced certain tenets of capitalism. Uh, but again, this global view is one that helps us to think about um, the, the challenges to the Interior Department's claims to a kind of global environmental management. And the, the social movements that challenged the Interior Department in the late 1970s and 1980s are a part of what I see in the book as a kind of deceleration period for the department alongside you know, the ascent of Reagan into power where there's a huge defunding of civilian agencies. These social movements challenge the legitimacy of Interior's um, management and these things kind of help to uh, lessen the department's global portfolio in turn. Um, I also see such activism resonating with these contemporary efforts in environmental justice to build a more sustainable and equitable world. Um, we are seeing a response to anthropogenic climate change itself tied to these legacies of a fossil fuel extractivism and a kind of expansive extractive capitalism that the department had helped to complete the, the spade work for. I'm not saying that the Interior Department was the singular or only actor doing this work of expansion, but that its history of expansion is one that has been consistently oriented to this North Star of extraction, and that this in turn has um, important stakes for thinking about a move away from fossil fuel dependence and toward renewable energy. But um, I think there are also conversations that we could have about how even the kind of most promising technologies, this, these green and, and great technologies draw from minerals and that there are um, important kinds of environmental justice questions that we should be asking about uh, whose lands and by what means will uh, the resources used to power green technologies be culled from. And, um, and what kinds of mechanisms can be put in place to ensure a level of consent and a kind of um, more equitable distribution of the benefits and tolls of those developments than had certainly been the case historically with this department. Um, so in short, while environmental institutions like Interior have no doubt done much good and um, and we see them as being very important in this pathway forward and combating anthropogenic climate change, their capacities to facilitate a push outward must be thought about and disrupted in important ways to avoid at least repeating the kinds of um, activities in the past that, um, that are a part of the story behind the um, the twin crises of global climate change and global inequality. So I will end there, I will open up for questions um, and I'm happy to draw out more about what I see as connections between this history and the history of um, anthropogenic climate change as, uh, as you all see fit, but uh, thank you. Thanks very much, Megan, for this wonderful presentation. Um, so dear colleagues, um, the, the, the queue is open. Uh, you can raise your hand in the Zoom and ask your question. Please introduce yourself in a few words 
Uh, and if for whatever reasons uh, you don't you don't feel like asking question, you can leave it in the chat, and I'm gonna read it aloud. All right, I got Sergey first. Hello, my name is Sergey Astafov. I am. Do, can you hear me? Yeah. I can. Yes. Thank you. Okay. So my name is Sergey. I'm a postdoc researcher at European University at Saint Petersburg, and uh, thank you for the fascinating lecture. Uh, and me. I just wanted to ask several clarifying questions. Sure. Uh, the first one is: uh, uh, Were there any major setbacks for the expansion of departments' influence? Because uh, from um, your review, it seems like it was linear. Mm -hmm. Uh, the Sorry. second question uh, uh, was or is there idea among department's personnel that the USA territory is too immense to be properly managed? Uh, that's a very strange question, but uh, there is some con context around it. And the third question is uh, when we talk about mineral resources, uh, were there any groups specialized in different types of minerals, for instance, radioactive elements mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, or fossil fuels or metals of some mm -hmm. other sort? And uh, were they competing or are they competing still <laughs> for yeah. uh, financial support or influence within the department and stuff right. like that? Great questions. Yes. Um, Sergey, thank you so much. I'll, I'll kind of start with that question about setbacks because it's so important and really invites us to think with historical methods that really emphasize contingency. And there's something that is unsatisfying and almost like a caricature of expansion to a story that just keeps widening out um, and, and seemingly does so without conflict. And the, the kind of portrayal that you get in the shortened version shows less of the friction than there certainly was. So your, your instincts are good there. Of course, there were certain kinds of challenges, but, um, but I am surprised by the extent to which the assumption that it was worth pursuing resources beyond borders held. So I'll kind of qualify that in a second. Um, the first way to kind of describe that is, you know, there were interior officials, the interior secretaries who had very different views about how to approach land management. And so you might think if they're conservative or if they're liberal or, you know, Democrat or, or um, Republican, they would have different approaches to um, whether they are conserving land and resources in the United States or privatizing it for a kind of more overt free-for-all. And that is the case. So in the 1920s, Albert Fall was the Secretary of the Interior. He was in power when a famous scandal happened, the Teapot Dome scandal, for which he was basically caught up in supporting um, and offering naval oil reserves to non-competitive bid of uh, private actors, Edward Doheny and Harry Sinclair. And he went to jail for being like overtly corrupt. But what is interesting is that, you know, that's a moment that gets a lot of attention because it was such an overt kind of personal pocket um, stuffing kind of activity. But, you know, Fall was still also somebody who was actively promoting foreign investments. Um, Mexico is one example that he's well known for. And part of what I see is that while there's a lot of different kind of personality across interior secretaries, it often is actually hinging more on what to do at home in domestic contexts of land use. And less so when, you know, sure, send people overseas. We have great trained geologists. Let's grow the profile of the United States in the world and disseminate them to, um, to know where resources are elsewhere. That seemed to be like a very palatable thing, regardless of political party affiliation, which is not to say that there were not other kinds of ruptures. So the Teapot Dome scandal is one that called a lot of negative attention. Santa Barbara oil spill in 1969 is another where its attempt to move on to the continental shelf and sell that as a, a friendly approach to extraction. Hey, there are no people. We're not, we're not setting off anti-imperialist alarms and this won't hurt people. But the, the um, accident that unleashed, you know, a million, three million gallons of oil into the Santa Barbara Channel suggested otherwise. And that diminished its, its kind of profile as well as the 
Environmental Protection Agency was created in the aftermath to, to try to create more regulatory function. So um, there were setbacks, there was a surprising trajectory. The, the mineral resources question is a, one that I'm really thinking about now. So I'm gonna kind of take that on next and say that, um, you know, the, there's like a, a rotating gallery of minerals that matter. And certainly there are moments when certain kinds of minerals matter more. I'll say that five times fast. But basically, um, we would know and expect that by the 1970s, energy resources were um, certainly supreme in the department's set of concerns. This was before the founding of the Department of Energy. They did less with radioactive material. Like they, if they found radioactive material, Sergey, they would send it to the AEC, AEC the Atomic Energy Commission. Um, but what they said, and I've seen speeches to this effect, and I think it's really important for our, our current moment, they said that all minerals are deeply interconnected, right? So if you, um, I can actually kind of turn to one quote where they note that, um, you know, military demands for aluminum require electric power, which requires coal, which requires mining machi machinery drawn from minerals and other metals. So the kind of deep interconnection of like minerals and then the kinds of things we might think of as fossil fuels, um, base versus metal versus organic um, uh, fertilizers or fuels, they work together and they scaled out together. And that's something that the interior department worked to help do is, is to scale them out. Now, I haven't gotten to your second question. I see there are some other hands raised and I might need you to repeat that, that provocative, helpful second question as well. So I don't know um, how, what you would suggest. I can, I can, I'll have you repeat that question. Um, and then maybe we can, I might fold my response into that along with some of the other uh, cue. What do you think, Dimitri? Yeah, I think that's that's fine, Sergey. Would you actually that's a very simple and uh, rather small question about big stuff? Mm -hmm. Is there idea or or uh, uh, was there an idea among the department's personnel that the USA territory is too big, gigantic, immense to be properly managed? Because mm. it's really huge. Yeah. And in, in Russia, historically, we have that kind of problem. So I, I'm thinking about oh, comparison. Right. Oh, yeah. that's a great, that's a great point. And I, I understand you better. Uh, um, great. I, I think that there was, um, that there probably is variegation across different experts over time. Um, you know, whether you're a Bureau of Mines director or just a field agent of that agenda. Um, but certainly at the, at the level of the, um, the interior department, it seemed like bigger was flashier and better for like a kind of reputational and legitimation process. Um, and so, I mean, there's no real sense to the interior department getting involved in the space race. There just, there isn't. I mean, their, their geologists were tapped to help with the problem of lunar geology and figuring out, like they developed an astro geology branch, but just to support with like applying what they knew to, um, celestial bodies. And yet there was such an appeal that someone like Udall and others, the geological survey director, William T. Pecora, would embrace this as a bold vision. So I think that there's like, um, there's probably a few levels, like in practice on the ground, <laughs> they probably were realizing the real limits to such a big agenda and an expansive agenda. But at the kind of level of, um, of, <sighs> what I see is an, an effort at continuing to have institutional relevance, that they um, were, were willing and um, eager to jump at new arenas of activity. Um, and that's really evident in like Harold Ickes too in the post-war, in the New Deal and post-war years where he says, yes, we'll take on division of territories and island possessions. Yes, we will take on Latin America. We will send experts there. And yes, we will take the continental shelf. There's just a like embrace that is um, a bit foolhardy, right? <laughs> like, and and I, I hear your point about that that comparison, and would need to think a bit more about that too. Trying to take on too much can leave you vulnerable on the peripheries as well. Not to stretch thing. Thank you. Yes, thank you. Okay, so I got Nikolai Rudenko, then Alexander Atkin, then Ivan Kurila. Nikolai. <laughs> 
Yeah, uh, thank you. Megan, thank you very much uh, for an interesting lecture. Um, I have one question. Uh, I wonder whether the context of transportation history or, mm -hmm. so to say, the history of technological media, uh, mm -hmm. is, uh, is this history uh, I'm interested in the context that you mentioned? I mean, because to mm -hmm. Um, you, you mentioned, for instance, that uh, they uh, sent the minerals from the um, from the third country, so to say, uh, yeah. to to the laboratories. So, so you need uh, to have like airplanes or uh, freight containers to do so. Mm -hmm. uh, is mm -hmm. this an interesting aspect of this story or not? Uh, Thank you very great. much. Thank you for that question. Uh, that's that's uh, great, and I would say under theorized in the book overall, um, but. There are moments where I find that to be really important. Um, so it is the case that you know I find the the will to like take these extremely heavy minerals and ship them all the way back as as something that indicates um, a lot about how how valid and valuable it seemed, right? Because that's like any any single sample is two tons, and like you say, it's going to need to be transported across road. It's going to have to be transported to a port. It's going to have to go from there um, over on a freighter uh, to another port. There's a lot of logistics involved. And I think that, you know, I, I would love to read <laughs> that book that really centers on the sinews of um, the global interior more than I do. But one, one moment that kind of stands out that's um, tied to the satellite is that what I realized is partly tied up in that desire to move to the orbital like location of a, a satellite is that the view is better than an aerial survey in the sense that like it would take about a hundred aerial surveys to fill the the canvas of what a Landsat image can show but the real advantage is that you aren't operating in national boundaries right you don't have to fuel in um you don't have to, I don't know, be registered as like an airplane with the government of, um, let's say, Saudi Arabia anytime you want to look, right? There's a way in which the way that um, the kind of technological and transportation side of the story of geological prospecting was much more tethered to the kind of um, the local communities in which they were operating. And what I see is that by taking it to outer space, it, uh, it's existing in a, an arena where it can transit across borders. And as part of open skies agreements, there's no kind of um, national check on that, right? And there was some debate about this in the 1970s where nations saw that they didn't need to consent to be viewed and were really distrustful of this kind of, um, this openness to the gaze, basically. This, what they called a new dynamic where there were sensing states and sensed states, and that um, the uh, United States government could at will and without any kind of permission look to um, sort of fix the geological potential of a certain place. Not with total certainty, not without, you know, it doesn't mean there aren't other ways that they would need to get ground truth and get um, get to those materials, but it did seem to um, to present a kind of a like a way to reduce friction. Because I think what your transportation question gets at is that there are there is friction in the process of taking minerals out of the ground and getting them to different kinds of markets, and there is also friction in getting to the knowledge around the minerals and that transportation is an important part of that story. So cool, thanks. Wonderful, thank you again. Yeah. All right, I got Alexander Etkind next. Thanks, um, I, I teach history at the European University Institute uh, at Florence. Uh, and I have three comments and questions uh, at once. So one is about resource globalism, which is a great concept. Uh, we, we hear much more often about resource nationalism, particularly mm. like, uh, when we're talking about uh, contemporary Russia, but also throughout the 20th century, that was a big issue with uh, Seven Sisters, with mostly with mm. oil, 
Mm -hmm. uh, you're talking mm -hmm. more about minerals. I think you are talking more about exploration rather than about actual development and drilling and the mining and mm -hmm. uh, you know actual pro prof profit making. Mm -hmm. Like when, when there are profits, probably resource nationalism was more relevant than right and right. um, this imperialist globalism or, ide or idealist globalism but uh, i okay. think that's a great uh, venue for kind of new new social so theoretical or conceptual yeah, yeah. Uh, research uh, one kind of po political or kind of almost philosophical idea that uh, you are talking really about the time you know 1960s 1970s and uh, a little bit about the 80s. Mm -hmm. That was the time when um, uh, the one global thinkers, or popular thinkers, public intellectuals were, were kept talking about post-industrialism, post-modernism, mm -hmm. about mm -hmm. information society, about the third wave, about all these uh, mm -hmm. uh, wonderful concepts which were very, you know, as distant from the source, from natural resources uh, mm. as possible and uh, more and more distant mm -hmm. and on, that was on the one side on the other side that was you know neoliberalism now libertarianism uh, mm -hmm. which was really about the uh, diminishing the role of the state mm -hmm. in, uh, in ruling these matters so mm -hmm. what you are uh, what you are uncovering goes really against all that first it is really about <laughs> hard nature rather than about information society or anything like that. Mm -hmm. and second, it's about uh, the direct uh, interventionist kind of uh, uh, reigning role, reigning fun functions of the state in organizing these basic processes of production. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, you, basically, you, 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 you barely mentioned anything like market forces. It was all right. about, uh, you know, state mm -hmm. plan. Not really planning, but state, state, um, state-led uh, organization of production, mm -hmm. extraction, extraction, and therefore production. Yeah, yeah. And then, then I have a third, more like historical uh, comment. Mm -hmm. uh, when you were talking about frontier, American frontier, and Turner also about uh, when you were talking about settler, mm -hmm. settler colonialism. Mm -hmm. um, I thought I like set, settlers, settlers, like, was it, is this set, set, settler colonialism, was it re truly relevant in the mid or late 20th century? It's so, so much later than, you know, all these settlers were actually settlers, mm -hmm. as, uh, at least one or 200 years later. Uh, I authored a book called Internal Colonization, uh, mm -hmm. about the Russian Empire. Mm -hmm. So the basic intuition is that, you know, okay, these frontiers, they are moving ahead, you know, in some countries to the west, in some other countries, like in Siberia to the east. Mm -hmm. But then there are these huge gaps within the national territory. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And they need also civilization, enlightenment, colonization. So this isn't, so I, 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 I believe that the concept of internal colonization Mm -hmm. uh, addresses the realities on the ground better than um, this really uh, anachronistic idea of mm. settler colonialism. Mm. Okay, great. Thank you so much. There's uh, there's just some really rich, uh, like, yeah, rich conversations that I think you're pointing me to, and I, I'm going to try to to show some moments where I think I'm speaking to them, but also say that I'm just happy to, to think more with and alongside them. So your point about resource globalism and resource nationalism is all is calling attention to the frame that I do focus much more on the planners, which might get to that last question you were asking as well. And part of um, the, the kind of literature that I was responding to came from economics and or economists and geologists in the kind of um, interwar period and then going into the, the um, Second World War when, um, when they were talking a lot about economic nationalism. So they weren't necessarily saying resource nationalism at the time in the way that the Seven Sisters or like the kind of profit-making drive that you're describing, but they were saying that that which drove that global conflict to be avoided through international order was a kind of rigidity of borders 
evident in protectionism and other forms of um, of political um, recalcitrance against market forces. So like they were flouting the kind of liberalization that people like Wilson and others would say, but this will bring peace, you know? And part of what geologists were saying is that within that story, hey, minerals exist across borders in a somewhat random fashion. And one way to also ensure peace would be to push for a kind of internationalism. Now they weren't saying globalism in that interwar period. I see more the post-war, the exigencies of the post-United Nations emphasizing the globalism and really the nation can recede all the more by that slight semantic shift. Um, but it is it is the case that um, there is a selective, like with this globalism, there is a selective nationalism baked within it. And I think your point really gets at that because as it is allied with, but not perfectly aligned with corporations and mining companies, there are times when these resources are global and there are times when they happen to fall back into like a national frame, whether as a like strategic resource or as a kind of um, existing in a, in a bank that belongs to someone somewhere within national borders as to kind of draw in the um, multinational or, or um, foreign um, uh, corporation angle. So I think connected to the question about the, the thinkers around uh, uh, the information society, the the kind of push to um, to remove the state as a kind of barrier to free market forces, I I definitely feel that I am in conversation with some great work coming out in that field. So someone like Quinn Slobodian's The Globalists um, is an influential piece here. Um, he is showing that there's a promotional component of state thinkers and actors to create conditions in which market forces can reign supreme over certain kinds of other government interventions, those that might shore up the welfare state or labor rights and things of that nature. So, um, but I also think that it is, it is the case that not many people bring minerals into that story. So I think I'm distinctly focusing on ways that, you know, rather than the kind of neoliberal story we get that Mining companies hate the state. Mining companies are the most um, anti-labor and therefore anti-state, anti-government regulation. And, and by virtue of that, um, have this kind of antagonistic relationship with the state that there were these sets of historical and ongoing relationships between the two. And that you know they consistently um, were interdependent, um, that the state often viewed its primary role to be promoting their well-being. And that doesn't mean that they were always perfectly synced up and agreed on what was in their mutual interest. And so that's interesting to see moments when that shifts around. Um, there was this kind of post-war moment. The, uh, the US government was actually sending out surveys to the top mining um, firms in the country including Phelps Dodge Corporation, National Lead Company, and so on, and asking them, hey, what, what could we do for you overseas? You know, What kinds of conditions would encourage your private investment overseas? And the options that they could tick were, tick were like you know, tax reform, like making it so you don't have to pay taxes, protections against expropriation. And they were really focusing on independent producers. So like the exception are the Seven Sisters who were already so widely invested internationally. But many mining firms were, you know, maybe they had an investment overseas or there. And then we would see a huge proliferation in the 50s, 60s, and 70s. And by extension, the pushback in the form of mass expropriations and nationalizations um, from, from others, um, uh, other nation states in the, the kind of third world and in new uh, NIEO context. So um, the, there is a, a kind of there is a move that I think I make where it, it is the case that I do try to bring the state planning component and the, the kind of promotional state back into the picture, in part because the interior department too is so often seen as the regulatory state. It, even as it, it does both, as do many parts of the American government, um, but often one only sees half of that story um, and in the case of the Interior Department, I think it's the weaker half by far um, relative to this 
this 20th century history. So, and the final point, I, you know, there's so much debate too in, in the literatures that I'm engaging in kind of US and uh, comparative um, settler colonial history about the value of this term. And we know it is so totalizing as one of its sins, you know, in that it's, um, it can reduce agency among people who are interacting with that structure. And, um, and I have, you know, in, in different moments framed for myself, what is happening as a kind of internal colonization, and especially in that Council of Energy Resource Tribes, that, that language is kind of ripe and the analysis that exists of indigenous responses to ongoing state colonial projects is to say, quit turning to your internal colonies, you know, like respect our sovereignty. And, and so your, your point about that, I think is, is well taken. And for, for my part, I think trying to um, draw out the parts of the definition that emphasize the vast expropriation of land as a kind of animating condition of the department is what is most valuable to me in the 20th century, I agree that its application is um, is not, it, it takes the specificity of that away to try to say that then mineral activities are settler colonialism when there is not coinciding settlement in a bid for elimination. Like, so I don't mean to do that. I guess more so I wanna say that there is an institutional connection in these two, that there are, um, there are certain skill sets and know-how that came from settler colonialism that have become a part of, you know, the, the kind of protocols and procedures implemented by the department that certainly take on new horizons. And I think we need to deal with those in their new iteration. So this is a kind of extractivism. And that I think is, is a framework that, that makes sense there where in the kind of context of the Indian OPEC, I think you're right that internal colonization is the frame that gives the gives the specificity that is needed for that historical um, event and moment. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And Ivan Kurila is next. Thank you. Thank you very much for your stimulating lecture. I am Ivan Kurila. I'm a professor at European University in St. Petersburg, and my major field is history of US Russian, Russian relations. And that, well, so I have a question, like probably simple one. I don't know, but uh, and the second uh, would be kind of a comment. So the question is you quoted uh, this uh, Northrop guy uh, saying yeah. that. Uh, he mentioned this underdeveloped area of the uh, of the free world. He mentioned mm -hmm. free world. So see, he uh, it was a, uh, already the concept of the Cold War division. But so I'm interested. Did uh, Department of Interior ever try to collect data from the US, USSR? Mm -hmm or from mm -hmm. the Russia, Soviet sphere of influence? Did it mm -hmm. also collect it? If not, how they define the borders of the free world, whereas mm -hmm. was the free world and whereas was not. I mean, it, it did, uh, uh, or were the cases when country uh, you know, moved from, from free world to, to the Soviet dominance or, or back? I mean, did the Department of Interior define these borders and how, how mm -hmm. they did? And the comment, uh, you know, from the constructivist point of view, the uh, Department of Interior back in the middle of the 19th century was uh, uh, created to deal with domestic others, you know, with others mm -hmm. from uh, capital law and uh, Native Americans with Indians. And uh, we see how this uh, tradition uh, reflect, well, uh, resonated when uh, with this Indian OPEC uh, and a half later. Yeah. And, uh, is it possible to think about the uh, Department of Interior activity uh, in the underdeveloped countries in the third world in the uh, same, within the same scope or the same framework of dealing with others, uh, mm -hmm. which actually possesses some you know, natural resources, of course, but mm -hmm. uh, as a parallel to American uh, dealing with uh, Native Americans. It mm -hmm. somehow is amazed to what uh, Alexander just asked about the uh, internal colonization, but yeah, I just wanted to, mm -hmm. to put it more, a little bit more in the Cold War uh, 
Great. Um, well, I appreciate, and I think these comments really build off each other nicely, um, Alexander and Ivan, thank you. Um, I'm thinking about the, um, there's a map of international development that I have seen and that I sometimes teach with in the classroom that I don't have on my PowerPoint, but I think I can try to render it for us, where um, from the earliest point that the uh, State Department was explaining where international development activities would, would be oriented, they had um, a color scheme of black, gray, and white. And the black color, or the black color was meant to signal um, not Italy or Spain. Um, so it's a totally political map. In other words, after the Second World War, that which is developed is um, called like basically Second World War allies and white settler, like former white settler nations. And, and, um, and you can kind of see that baked into it, though it's consciously like the color black and not white. The gray is something like Italy, Spain, Argentina, um, and the Soviet Union. So those are kind of politically marked as, um, you know, it's framed as an economic distinction with no politics involved, but it's clearly still framed as an extension of uh, Second World War and a kind of acceleration of Cold War animosities. And then that which is um, in need of development is everything else. So as far as the Interior Department's role, I, I would say that their attention is focused on competing in zones of potential influence of the USSR and less focused on um, trying to get at the intelligence of what might be had. And there I think is a civilian military distinction because it is the case that there are you know, emerging forms of like reconnaissance satellites that were top secret that I think I suspect would fit more into the, the kind of the, where your question is going with what did they know about what um, the USSR had. Now that's, that's not to say that it doesn't exist. It's more that the thrust of what I've seen with interior officials is that they were accepting the kind of the cartography um, of, of what we know to be a highly political explanation for economic development. So that's part one. And the second question about managing others, I think is a really uh, good point. Sometimes I think of the politics of the interior department's move from interior to exterior zones as a politics of conflation. And in that it's like just taking uh, ways of interacting with others and like losing specificity, particularity and assuming that that model holds in another environment. Um, I would add that primitive as like a qualifier in front of others was very often used in the kind of early um, to mid 20th century and fell out of the lexicon towards the 60s and 1970s as makes sense. But, um, but you see the language that would often be attributed just to people and that still kind of resides. The um, primitive people failed to understand how to use resources. And that's a logic that I also look at in the book that seems much what farther reaching into the past, right? It has ties to like even doctrine of discovery in a kind of Western philosophical framework of um, colonization. But the um, but what happens in the kind of group of actors that I look at is that the methods are primitive. You know, there are primitive methods for mining that people use in these backward zones. You know, so there's like some some. Um, some change that is happening while there are nevertheless um, echoes of um, the assumption that um, native peoples were primitive peoples who failed to understand and properly use resources. Foreign peoples under the context of this underdeveloped framework were also primitive but increasingly backward peoples who just needed help being oriented to the future. And you can see how the claims to time are very similar, right? Trapped in anti-modernity, looking backward, tradition versus modernization, future, um, uh, like a, a progress 
oriented to the future that is defined by capitalist development in the kind of Cold War logic of someone like Walt Rostow, <laughs> whose anti-communist manifesto was, um, was in, you know, important to the, the kind of late 50s and 60s version of this, um, of how the state planners viewed their work in the third world as well. So um, I wanna know more about it though. And I, I think this is the perfect audience. I kind of just wanna ask you all because you might suspect that I've been asked a lot about comparisons to Russia and the Soviet Union, um, different historical contexts. And, um, and I would be happy to hear more from you about um, what feels very different about the, the ways that uh, what come to appear as domestic, but like the settlement processes and 19th century histories and how those did or didn't shape Cold War and 20th century histories. Um, I don't know if you have the answers for me, but uh, it's it's something that I, I'm learning more about from my colleagues all the time as they, um, they point out that the category that I deal with a lot, which is American exceptionalism, that's like a big centerpiece of my fields in U.S. empire studies, um, is based on the assumption that, well, the United States is so convinced of its anti-imperialist origins that it simply cannot fathom its imperial actions, right, or that um, it insists that it cannot be an empire. And a colleague uh, who is a Russian historian pointed out to me that, well, there's a similar tension in not being an empire um, at play in, in Russian history. So I think there are more parallels than my research kind of suggests. Um, and it seems like some of your questions are possibly getting to, to some of those points of comparison. So I don't know if people have thoughts, Ivan or Dmitry or... or... Alexander. Yeah. Uh, uh, thanks. So, so it's my duty as a moderator to uh, read the question left in the chat, posted oh. by, and it's actually it's it's uh, it ties together uh, some things that have already been said, posted by Natalia Trigubova, who is our colleague from uh, the Comparative Sociology Department of the State University. And the question is: uh, uh, Is there any comparative research on U.S. and Soviet policies in this area during the Cold War? <laughs> is there? <laughs> <laughs> Great. Um, well, the two, one, I'll say two works that I'm thinking of that are not the context that I'm talking about exactly. Um, a colleague of mine at MIT named Kate Brown has done comparative work to think about plutonium manufacture in the American West and um, in um, the context of the Urals. And so I am... Um, yeah, you, yeah, great. Um, so, so that's a great example that comes from somebody who is a, a, a Russian scholar, a scholar of the Cold War. And then um, a kind of different take on this, there's a recent book by Bathsheba Damuth that's about whaling. And it looks at the, you know, it, it also kind of um, challenges assumptions that the kind of communist and capitalist models of commercial whaling would be totally different. Like one might assume there would be um, key differences based on the, uh, the different way of organizing the economic activity, but, um, but that there were a lot of resonances or, or um, that both veered toward overfishing and pra practices that have since become like an object of environmental concern and, and otherwise. So those are, those are my kind of limited windows onto this subject being pretty firmly rooted in this. Um, and yeah, I, I think that um, the, I'd, I'd just love to, to see more of this work. I don't know if others have, feel free to send citations through the chat or, um, or make recommendations to this effect. My sense is that this, the historiography on international development is also doing this kind of comparative work to say different uh, modes of production, but high modernist uh, dam building as like a shared investment uh, across um, that is, is something I don't really theorize or think too much about, but I'm, I'm eager to learn from. Um, I see Sergey has a, a question through the chat also about a skill set. Um, yeah, so when I think of skill set, there's, oh, yeah, no problem, Natalia. Thank you for your question. Um, 
the one one example where I got to thinking about this issue separate from the Northrop quote where he's directly talking about this know-how is to think about citational practices also. So if you look at the bibliographies of the geological reports that are produced in Afghanistan, invariably you will see that the work they are citing is based on like reports from the 1890s or whatever from Nevada. You will see that the geologists who go to Latin America in the 1940s are referring back to their work in Oregon or in Colorado or in you know, other zones. And sometimes you know, that's a personal embodied experience in the case that, that latter case that I just mentioned. And in that case, you know, to kind of build from Alexander's point, it's not the case that they're you know, in the 19th century in one context and in the 20th century in another, but that they are in zones whose histories have been really actively shaped by the extractivism and settlement of the earlier era. Um, and a place like Butte, Montana really calls to mind those, that nexus of those um, histories. But in some cases, what they can know about resource extraction is tied to that those 19th century moments of, um, of discovery as it's framed, even as indigenous peoples knew of the existence of these um, minerals and often made use of them in different ways. Um, so on some level, it's not necessarily like this insidious intent to direct a like nefarious skill set toward the, the process of expansion. It's really just like how knowledge gets reproduced in a way that is, um, as we know, very much about power, but, um, but plays out in very practical ways. Like one needs to know something about um, mining molybdenum. How can, we, how can we know about mining molybdenum? Well, we can turn to the um, extraction of molybdenum in Gunnison County in Colorado on what had been Tabagawachi Ute lands as part of the silver and gold and lead mining, you know? And that's, that's the citational practice, even as it might seem to be about, you know, totally different, <laughs> different processes underway in, um, in foreign nations. Um, so that's, that's something that, <sighs> I, I kind of stick with like how to how to think about bibliography as informing how one approaches then the future and a way that there's like a kind of time capsule in that um, in that process, but um, but on some level there's a way that like exploratory reconnaissance for minerals in the 20th century period that I write about looks really really similar <laughs> to. The kind of processes and protocols of like the Hayden survey or the um, the work of John Wesley Powell in the mid 19th or the the kind of 1860s and after and you know sometimes it's changed because they have a jeep but sometimes it's still 1950 and they're still loading up their burrows with their pickaxes and they're still using some of the same rudimentary tools to um, to chart out the um, the geological conditions uh, in their midst, and um, to me, that's that's something that, of course, seems to have very little to do with people or politics. It's just a, it's just the application of knowledge, but um, but it also is the case that it's not happening separate from a local context, and that you know, in as in nineteenth century versions where the existence of indigenous peoples was just, you know, incidental or accidental or a nuisance. I think there is a similar um, through line in the way that the geologists who are embedded um, in Colombia or elsewhere are viewing the, the, the process. So, um, so in, in that way, I think this, this is less meant to serve as a, a, a gotcha moment for these people than to say, you know, to take seriously the, the call in the present about like, how do we decolonize institutions or how do we deal with knowledge systems that have 
um, continually reproduced a certain kind of order and worldview. Um, and I think that it's interesting to ask, well, how, what is it about the, the kind of geological survey that um, has <laughs> continued to facilitate um, the exploitation of people beyond borders or of uh, alternate sovereignties? Because I no longer, I don't look at geological surveys as being neutral, like looking at the reports after 2004, um, when the global war on terror has created an opening for the US Geological Survey to return to Afghanistan. Um, after you know a period where in the 1950s, the US Interior Department had been in Afghanistan in the like Logar province looking for chromium. And then you know they, they had some international development programs before the Soviet period. Those were abandoned after the Soviet period. The United States had not been in Afghanistan in the same way, but in 2004, they were celebrating this um, ability to survey what they estimated would be $1 trillion worth of minerals, including things like lithium, which we know to be a part of the green technology rush. And, um, and in this case, they're not aware of the history of the geological survey being there in the 1950s. They're completely unaware, but this one report celebrated the chromium deposits of the Logar province in, you know, fit fully 50 years after the original kind of work in that same area on that same mineral. And, um, and I mean, that's a case where the conditions are such that it's more obvious the political violence at stake in this work of surveying and knowing. Um, but I, I think that I've seen it in more subtle ways as well in Peru, in the Philippines, in these, um, in these sites of the department's activity and influence. Um, so, yeah, I, but I should also turn this over to my STS colleagues because I do, I, I learn from them all the time about, you know, ways to think about expertise and, and knowledge um, as, as it relates to politics and society. Um, so thank you. Thanks for that invitation to think out loud. And for all of these questions, this has been really great. Yeah, if I may, Megan, I'd like to ask another one uh, from the STS people, uh, in part at mm -hmm. least, a part of, part, of, part of us are doing work in STS, uh -huh. and uh, I'm going to follow up on to what Sergei said in the beginning, um, and try to tie certain things together. So, um, so the first question, uh, Sergei asked you about uh, whether there were any ideas in the Department of Interior, uh, you know, about how to manage the immense uh, kind of resources that... Um, Mm -hmm. they claimed um and we've been discussing this for 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 some time uh mm -hmm. because um uh well you know in, in russia this discourse uh, also has uh, deep roots and uh, our president recently mentioned a quote from one of the tsars alexander III, who said something the alexander the third who said something like we are feared because of our immensity um and so we've been discuss discussing this uh um because uh, this idea of uh, scale being uh, so large that it uh, creates important implications for management of the object that has such larger scale, the territory, the natural resources. Um, uh, this discourse is remarkably uh, continuous because we used to, you know, to, to hear uh, things like that being said about the territory, about the uh, uh, you know, fossil fuel endowments, but now people talking about decarbonization and green technology say basically mm -hmm. the same thing, but uh, when they talk about forests and, uh, you know, uh, um, uh, drinkable water endowments and uh, the immense swamps in, in, in Western Siberia that help to cool the planet. And yeah. so it, it seems to be something, uh, well, something must, must account for this continuity. Um, mm -hmm. And uh, so my question is uh, that it, it has two parts, right? So one part is that um, uh, with, with climate change looming and, and the climate politics uh, um, assuming more and more uh, 
uh, um, well, I don't know, virulent forms perhaps, uh, the kind of resources that are relevant is changing, even though the kind of framing stays continuous, at least here, as far as we can tell, right? And mm -hmm. so STS has a penchant for materiality. So uh, mm -hmm. what is, um, like, do you think that uh, uh, was, was the history of Department of Interior that you uncovered, is there a similar kind of continuity regardless of the change of the materiality of resources? with, you know, in, in, in the kind of global warming, uh, climate change politics context. Uh, and so, the, so that's, that's about the stuff, right? Mm -hmm. And the other thing is about scale, um, because, and that's really what Sergei asked. Uh, mm -hmm. I, I noted that you mentioned Quinn Slobodan's work, uh, um, which uh, I am familiar with because part of what I'm interested in is history of economics. And the book is called The Globalists, and it's actually about the origins of neoliberalism. And so one of the points that he makes, uh, I think, is that uh, basically the, the, uh, the pristine neoliberals did some, like Hayek and, and, and others, did some work in uh, early business cycle research. And uh, they were stunned at the scale of the economy as a kind of almost a sublime object. Uh, and that sort of influenced their views uh, on how to manage the economy. So it's so big that it's impossible to know even, let alone manage. So my question is, how do you see, do you see any like path dependency uh, for the US case in terms of um, how this the ideas about the nature of resources to be managed and about the scale um, uh, uh, impact the actual management practices? Mm. So I'll just say you cut out a little bit on the question about Slobodian um, and I think, um, you know, maybe when, you can kind of rephrase that for me um, when we get to that second part. How about I, I start with the, the, the first question about the stuff and the materiality and the, the different nature of the commodities being targeted. Um, I, I definitely understand the point that the, the materiality of something alters the way in which it is extracted and therefore, you know, has very different kind of ramifications for local communities, for instance. So there are certain kinds of minerals that lend themselves to strip mining versus a kind of underground mining. And, you know, there are certain labor dangers that are associated with underground mining that may not be as intense with certain kinds of strip mining, but then the environmental harms have a different kind of scale or a different kind of visibility, frankly, because in one case, like the tailings ponds might be the, the greater danger with like toxic sludge that is used in the kind of separating out of the materials. And that, you know, so I've mentioned underground mining and surface mining, but then there's also oil um, extraction. And there we know are environmental dangers and social costs to oil's extraction. Our current frame is such that we are often thinking about the combustion of those fossil fuels as that which is actively harming um, or harming at the scale of global warming. And um, I think that historically, these, these do ride together in many ways to kind of get back to that comparison that I made. This isn't to say, of course, there are specialists who are really passionate about different kinds of minerals relative to the broader institution. And, you know, that which was considered the most strategic and critical mineral in 1937 was different from 1972 um, or 73. Uh, and it depended a lot on how these materials were used in different technologies. So the, um, the case of manganese is such that it's vital to the production of steel, and it happened not to be in the U.S. in high quantities. Um, instead, like Brazil and India and, and other, uh, and Cuba had like rich reserves. So there's there are certainly ways that um, the kind of technological uses toward which materials could be produced changed what was valued most in a year or in a decade, perhaps. Um, and that, you know, many of these had different kinds of social and e ecological costs um, that were 
all meant to be managed by the department and how successfully that was managed is, is certainly up for debate. And there are cases where it may be more effective than others. Um, so one thing that I have been thinking of, I think along with you, as we are asking about this transition, the energy, uh, renewable energy transition is um, not only like where this stuff is coming from, that's important and I raised that in my talk, but also how much energy is going to be exerted to get the stuff out of the ground and what implications does that have for decarbonization? So there are reports that help us to understand just how mining or how intensive, how carbon intensive the mining industry is, even though it's not about oil, right? So 11% of the world's energy use is tied up in extraction. And that's a significant portion. So to get to decarbonization using green technologies um, entails an, an input of energy that we know is an output of carbon or an input into the, the atmosphere. Some other stats that I found interesting, metals mining went from being a, an 11 billion tons industry in the 1970s to today of 53 billion tons annually, according to the World Bank. Um, and that as that grows, the carbon um, combustion to get the stuff out of the ground grows. So I've had students at MIT who have interned for like Rio Tinto Zinc, which is not you know, as invested in fossil fuels, but has to expend so many fossil fuels to get the um, lithium, like not necessarily lithium, copper out of the ground in that case. And that I think raises questions, but it also ties then to the problems of carbon capture that I think you are also getting to Dimitri about the, um, the eradication of biodiversity that is a part of the carbon sequestration strategy of like both the global commitment to set aside 30% of land to avoid uh, as part of the goal to uh, mitigate climate change. And, um, and yeah, I mean, undercutting these other ways of subtracting carbon to mine things is, is something that is that must be thought of in the contemporary context. It's, I think there are echoes of these kinds of problems in the history that I recount, but this is why I've, I've found value in kind of expanding and contracting and like keeping certain keeping minerals together because often it's the technocrats, the same technocrats who are broadly superintending their fate. Um, but understanding that, you know, certain um, ones become key players in different moments. Um, and in that sense, there's a, a, maybe more of a pattern we can see and, and possibly learn from, part of which is to say, anticipate needing to be responsive because a one size fits all solution invested entirely in one set of mineral commodities or entirely in oil will yield other problems, right? So there's like a kind of calibration um, that governments struggle to do because instead there's like the big bold plan to get to the question of scale, <laughs> you know? So then your, your question about scale, I might need you to repeat and you are thinking about it alongside uh, Slobodian's work. Um, so maybe, yeah, Dimitri, do you want to do you want to kind of yeah. say that again? I'm sorry. So, so I mentioned Slobodian, Slobodian's work because uh, I think one of the arguments he makes is that the uh, early, you know, the early sort of neoliberal thought was influenced by some of the protagonist experience of doing early business cycle research, in mm -hmm. which people like Hayek were stunned by the immensity of the object they they studied, the economy. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. the, you know the concepts of the economy were also emerging uh, roughly at that time, right? And so this 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 imagination of the economy as this huge, almost sublime uh, object influenced the ideas of of you know ways of properly managing this 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 huge thing, right? And so so that that was uh, um, you know quite the question is the same. It's about scale and how how visions of scale impact practices of management. And you've touched upon that already. Uh, I just, um, yeah, yeah I, I was following up onto what Sergei said because here at least we observe this continuity because people, um, you know, uh, uh, say things that we've got so so much, uh, I mean, we've got so, uh, our forests are so huge that uh, an entire industry can be uh, built around that. And so there's the same argument that uh, Russia is very well endowed 
but this time not with oil, but with, you know, with, with forests that, that suck uh, uh, carbon from the atmosphere. Mm -hmm. so, so my question was, yeah. Uh, yeah, th that's great. I mean, my, I, I love that um, because it, it's calling attention to a frame that is often assumed among mineral experts, which is scarcity actually, right? So there's like a way in which there is an immensity uh, two minerals that is framed as scarcity and what different kinds of work or imaginaries that might call forth because it seems less that my historical actors are intimidated by the thought of like how to approach this I mean the problem the scale of the problem is vastly concerning and you can see people thinking in like neo-Malthusian ways about resources and population like so so that is um something where you see them being overwhelmed and the the resources for freedom cover really conveys that logic like a panic over enough resources for a growing population but um but there's also a way that they are constantly committed to this idea of scarcity which does cut against a, a, certainly a 19th century national identity rooted in abundance and endowment, you know. So um, Brooks Adams, uh, who's the son of a former president, commented on the, um, the United States uh, robust mineral endowment, which assured its singular role in, in the world compared to Europe with, you know, tiny, tiny countries, you know, is kind of the Brooks Adams line. And that's classic American exceptionalism too, to kind of denigrate others on grounds of size and say, we don't need to be imperialist because we have this natural abundance. And all of those categories are front. But, um, but I, I wonder then relative to Slobodian's work, what, yeah, like what those kinds of different objects that they're looking at um, what kinds of moves it invited them to make. I mean, scarcity is a useful frame because it justifies a lot of intensity of action, of you know, political investment in um, scouring the globe for resources, but it's also highly constructed, even as in the moment it's sincerely felt and by many. Julia Klinger is a, a geographer who has written about rare earth frontiers. And one of her key observations is, oh, by the way, they're not rare. 17% of the earth's composition is a rare earth element. And there's nevertheless a geopolitical motive uh, to labeling them as being rare. And so I think that where, where economy meets materiality, there's this odd kind of, um, dynamic where there is a kind of movement between um, the immensity of the problem and then the seeming like uh, the the shortages you know I could I could put out some charts for you that show and anticipate the um, disappearance of, of things not the um, so it's like I guess the abundance in that case or the immensity is about consumption not um, not, we have so much, we have such a big canvas on which to work. How do we go about doing our, our job, if that makes sense? Um, yeah, thanks very much. That, that makes a little sense. Um, yeah, um, so, so it's four past eight, uh, unless we have other questions. Um, I, I think you all deserve probably to get on with your your evenings, your white nights in the, um, well, I know that not all of you are located in St. Petersburg, but um, yeah, I'm, um, I feel bad to have keeping, kept people up so, so late relative to, you know. Well, life. well, that, that, that was, that was really uh, uh, interesting. Uh, I just want to thank you very much, Megan, again, for being with us uh, on behalf of the audience as well. Um, and uh, why don't we give uh, Megan a round of applause with oh, Thank you. <laughs> with this. This, was, this was so much fun for me and really, really interesting. I have tons of notes that I'll be sitting with and thinking over for weeks to come. So um, thanks for your, your listening and your, your insight. Yeah, thank you. All right. Bye, um, everyone. Stay well.